Um, so we are fortunate to have with us today Tobias Lana from PPH Zurich. Um, Tobias um, did his undergraduate studies in Tübingen and in Uppsala in Sweden. Both? How does that work? <laughs> ah, I'm born in Sweden. You're born in Sweden, but yeah. I moved there and yeah. then I forgot the language and I told myself I should do that. Okay. I learned the language, but then I. Uh, okay, <laughs> uh, cool. Anyway, so then he did his PhD at ETH Zurich and then he was um, studying critical behavior with both guys. Um, he was a postdoc um, at Shilla. Boulder, um, working on ground state cooling of the cavity off of the animal device. Um, and then since 2013, he's been uh, back at ETH as um, a permanent researcher there. Um, and he has um, built up really beautiful experiments studying quantum gases and optical cavities, um, kind of bringing together, I would say, perhaps the more standard cool rocks of quantum simulation with ultra values together with. Both on EDA and long range interactions, and that's allowed them to study um, remarkable phenomena such as super solidity and um, they go into a little bit of principles of matter and light. So that. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation to speak here uh, at Stanford, where I'm for the first time. I'd like to talk to you about, um, well, this kind of Crystals of matter and light, what we do is uh, putting a bosine synchronization, a common gas in the opposite cavity, and then this arrangement gives rise to long range interactions between the particles. And that's our artistic view on what goes on. We have two atoms in this gas, and they interact with each other by the exchange of photons. And these photons are bouncing back and forth in the opposite cavity. And uh, this is the arrangement which gives rise to long range interactions, which, if they're sufficiently strong, Makes the system crystallize, and that's why we have crystals of matter. But that's something which we have studied quite a while. And what I would like to tell you today is what dissipation is doing, or what we observe what dissipation is doing to the system. But let me take one step back and um, start with a quantum many body system, so a connection of particles which obey to some quantum statistics. And such a system only becomes really interesting if we add interactions to it. Now, if it's interacting, then um, you can imagine that such a system can undergo a phase condition and we have different ground states. And these ground states depend on the type and the strength and the range of those interactions. So you can imagine that there are two different orders. And which of the orders is now the ground state of the system depends on external parameters, which, if it's a zero temperature system, um, is then actually a quantum phase condition between those two. So let's say we have a control parameter lambda which we can tune, and then there's a critical point at which the system switches from one to the other order, and that's a phase condition. Now, this type of phase conditions have been extensively studied using article atoms, or quantum gases. And um, what's now new, or what I would like to tell you about, is what happens if we add to the system dissipation. So dissipation will, well, make all the excitations leave the system and eventually even all the particles leave the system so then it becomes quite boring so what we need to do is to replenish what we have as dissipation with a drive and then we have a so-called driven dissipated system and now we should not think of a ground state anymore but we should think of steady states which the system is going into and um, that's the physics but the question is how is this physics different from what we know from um, the closed systems. One thing that you can easily imagine is that, uh, well, the critical point might be shifted slightly due to the presence of this arrangement, but there's more which can go on. For example, it can change the criticality of the system. So, criticality is if you know uh, you have a second order phase condition, then you have fluctuations which diverge coming to the critical point. And this divergence is characterized by critical exponents, and this allows you to describe the system in universality classes. And such a universality class changes if you make the system open. That's something which we had observed in the past. What I would like to talk about today is about emergent dynamics. So if the system is not anymore going into a stationary state or steady state, but it can happen that this dissipation gives rise to non-stationary behavior like synchronization or limit cycles and chaos. And what I would like to show you here is that we observe emergent pumping. So you might know about topological pumps. 
And that's something which emerges here in this open system due to the anticipation of the fact. Um, at the end of the talk, I would like to also tell you about um, a dissipation induced or stabilized phase. So these are two different phase diagrams, but it's the same system. Once it's open, the otherwise, and in the other case, it's closed. So this is closed, this is open. And you see that there's a qualitative change, and we look at this theoretically and also experimentally. Okay, but let me start with these emergent dynamics. Um, since I didn't know the audience, I do a small recap on cavity QED or many body cavity QED. I know that there's uh, lots of activities here, especially from Monica and from, from Ben's group. Um, but let me just tell you we have a ozone and condensate of rubidium 87 atoms inside the high mass optic cavity. And we illuminate these atoms with a transverse pump standing wave in the field. This laser field is far detuned from atomic resonance, such that the atoms are not electronically excited, but they just act as scatterers for the photons. So I told you at the beginning about these long range interactions, and here's the microscopic process. The photon from the pump is scattered at the first atom into the cavity and then back into the pump at the second atom. Now, those two atoms are interacted with each other by the exchange of the photon. So it's a, it's a virtual process if you want, and or virtual excitation of the cavity. And since this photon is delocalized over the entire cavity mode, this interaction is of low duration. Very important for us here is this dissipation channel. So it allows us to measure in real time what goes on um, in the quantum gas, and we can look at those photons, and it will change the physics as I told you. Um, if you like to look at the review article, here is uh, one which we recently published. So this gives rise to. Ah, this gives rise to the picture which I've shown to you at the beginning. Uh, now, to study it, it's helpful to look at the single particle mechanism. And um, you will see that it's the beauty of using a Bose Einstein condensate is um, that it turns out to be very simple because we can go through a few modes which can be out. So, taking only a single um, particle coupled to the scalability, you see that. Um, there is an energy which is given by the photon which lives inside the cavity in a frame rotating at pump frequency. Then there's kinetic energy of the particle. There's a pump lattice potential, so that's the standing wave potential um, uh, along our pump. And there's a cavity lattice potential which goes with the number of photons. So initially the cavity is empty and this potential is not there. But you see there's a strength which is here given by the coupling strength of these atoms to the cavity. And this is the depth of the lattice. This last term here is the most important one. You see, it's the product of the two wave functions or mode functions. So it inherits the remote structures of the applied um, electric fields, and it's actually a checkerboard lattice. And this is what gives rise to this long range interactions between the particles. It goes with the coherent field inside the cavity. And so it's a competition now between kinetic energy, which wants to flatten out the wave function. You think of the good Einstein condensate and this interaction potential, which allows the atoms to lower their potential energy if they go into this lattice potential and fill the cavity part. So, there's actually a phase transition from a normal phase to a super radiant phase, and uh, this is given by the competition between those two energy states. If you take a cut through this potential um, in the self organized um, uh, phase, then you will find that it's a lambda periodic potential. And um, you see that there are two copies of it one is dashed, one is solid, and this corresponds to the symmetry which is broken at this position. Now, going to the many body description, we have to sandwich our single particle Hamiltonian by the, or in between those two feet operators. And now comes the nice thing about the Bose-Einstein condensate, which is that we can describe this matter um, component just by two states. One is the Bose-Einstein condensate, where there's a zero momentum state of the atoms, and the other state is an excited momentum state, which, if you see here, this is the BEC and scattering the photon at this BEC into the cavity means that you are exciting an atom to this um, excited momentum state. So one photon into the cavity and one back to the pump gives you a and, and symmetric superposition of these four momentum states. So you see that the field operator can be described by this very simple formula here. 
And using this formalism, we can show that you can map this full system onto a spin model like the Peter model, which then allows you to explore these spin systems. Okay, that's uh, one of our setups. And you see here the heart of it. These are two mirrors. It's a comparison in size. If you don't know how large uh, one Swiss franc is, then this mirror is uh, three millimeters in size. Now you know the size of the Swiss franc. <laughs> <laughs> and we face these two mirrors um, just by 180 microns. So this gives us, you know, brings us into the single atom strong coupling regime, which is so important for these kind of experiments, but it gives you a scale of the system. Now, producing this volatile condensate in the cavity and then letting the atoms fall and kind of flight, you see here the, well, this gray shaded area is given by the by the, the face of the two mirrors we are looking at, and this is the narrow gap in which we see now our 100,000 atoms at below 100,000 temperature. This is buried in the second chamber, the vacuum chamber is surrounded by optics, I guess, very much as um, I will see in your lab. Okay, that's just a reminder of this case condition. You see, we start illuminating the atoms with light. This power of this illuminating light field is this dashed line here, which you see is raised over time. And at the same time, you look at the photons leaking out of the cavity, which is this blue line. So you see, although we are sending light onto the atoms, there's no light being scattered into the cavity. That's destructive interference. If we were to take a time of flight image, you see that it's mostly on the uh, zoom component of the DC, which is populated. This changes if these interactions are um, exceeding the, the kinetic energy. And then you see that we find lots of light, a coherent field inside the cavity, and we have these additional momentum peaks which are occupied. And this signals now the space transition to the super radiant cell phone space. The same there. For hundreds of milliseconds, and if you went down our pump power again, then we arrive back at our Budai's concept. You can not only look at the photon number, but you can also look at the phase of this light field. And this tells you that it's a huge field. So we use a heterodyne detection system and look at now the phase of the cavity field. You can see that it's locked to a certain value, and this uh, is now a coherent field scattered at the spread planes of atoms. If you go in and out of this space condition multiple times, then you see that the space seems to be locked to either of the two values which are separated by pi. So this time phase of the cavity is either in or out of phase of the pump. And this uh, signals that the atoms are sitting on either the even side or the odd side of the chicken complex. This corresponds to the picture I've shown you about these potentials. And if you were to plot an order parameter, then that's the typical signature which you know. Of uh, breaking the symmetry at this point, and then you have a final order for space transition. Okay, so far so good. That was the wrap up to have everybody on board. Now we move on, um, and I will tell you about self organization in repulsive projections. So, everything I've shown until now were light fields which were rectitude tuned with respect to the atomic resonance. So, atoms were attracted towards the intensity maxima. Um, we are switching now the machine, so we are looking into another setup, and these are actually two cavities which cross. So look from top, you see these are the two cavities formed by two pairs of mirrors. What's important here is only one of those pairs, and this is a wave reflector, so this is our arrangement, and that's the concept of it. We still keep uh, for the second now um, a attractive potential. I show you the same physics I've shown you in the last part here. Um, for this new setup, I can show you a phase diagram. So we ramp up pump power at a fixed tune between pump and cavity, and everything which is red here signals that there are photons inside the cavity, which is self organized. So you see that the further we get tuned from, from cavity resonance, the more power is needed in this lattice, in this pump lattice here, in order to make the system self organized, which is just again energy scale. If you are to take a kind of light image, then it looks like this, and you see it's huge but, uh, with respect to what I've shown you in the first slide, of because we have this angle of 60 degrees between pump and cavity. 
fine. So this is an uh, attractive case. Now let's go to the repulsive case. And that's a bit surprising, or at least for me it was surprising, because if you think of a blue lithium light field, then you know that the atoms are trying to hide from high intensities, so they are pushed into the dark. And now, if you are pushing atoms into the dark, you could expect that self-organization, where atoms need to scatter lots of photons into a cavity, is inhibited. But that's not the case. And uh, we've seen that the system can still self-organize. And if we write down the equations and uh, plot it, then it actually looks like this. And what happens here is that the atoms are actually going into the regions of maximum intensity. So although they are repelled from this light field, they go to the region of maximum intensity, scatter photons into the cavity, and then this cavity field destructively interferes with the pump at the location of the atoms. So it's a funny process where they dig their own uh, potential minimum into um, the maxima of these um, blue between light fields. And in this way, the system can still self organize but has a bit different features than their attractive fields. So here is in red, as you see, it's for uh, rapid tuning. So this is the attractive case. Uh, this was the time of light image in real space. Well, we don't have a microscope yet, at least. But in real space, it would look like this. So this is the checkerboard that I was talking about. And if you now go for this blue tuned case, then you see that the phase diagram looks qualitatively different. So at some point, the atoms are exiting again this self organized space. That's what we observe. If you take a time of light image, you see that um, different momentum peaks are occupied, or there are less momentum peaks occupied. So, what used to be the pump, or corresponding to the pump lattice, those two peaks here, has vanished now, exactly because the atoms have erased this lattice by scattering light into the cavity. And if you would uh, take a, a real space image from this um, configuration, you would find that it's not a checkerboard, but it's stripes which form inside. So it's a different structure, two central symmetric but different structures. Okay, we understand this well. We go back to this um, to this single particle Hamiltonian, and I told you that dp is the pump lattice depth, and u naught is this uh, coupling to the cavity, and both scale with one over the atomic tuning. So if you flip now the sign of the atomic tuning. Both of these terms will also flip their sign. However, the product of the two, which goes into the interaction potential, will remain as it was before. So now um, it's about the sum of those two terms, which dominate or which determines how the atomic structure will look like. For the rectitude case, you see this is our pump potential. Atoms can lower the energy if they go to this minimum here. So this will be the atoms in the ground state. And if I plot, plot on top this interaction potential, then you see it actually has a lambda periodicity and the minimum at the same position as um, their complex. And so if you are coupling these two states, um, then you see the symmetric coupling. And um, if I zoom into the potential, which I've shown to you previously, that it's exactly the structure which you see here. Let's look for the same thing for the blue two case. What happens is that we have to flip the sign of the pump lattice, so this goes up now. So you see atoms are repelled from this position and they will move to the sides. So they sit here, but now this interaction potential remains where it was. So if you want to couple the two, then we have to change the parity of the state. So it's an anti symmetric coupling. And if I now plot this potential, you see it's still lambda periodic, but it's a um, double well structure, which is lambda periodic. And this is now this different structure in, in space, which can form in the blue case. Okay, so you've seen that we can have uh, blue tunes and red tunes uh, phase diagrams, and um, there's a way how we can actually use both at the same time. So I would like to show you how we can uh, engineer a phase diagram which looks like this. And you can already see what we do here is. We not only use the standing wave, what I've seen shown to you until now, but we actually use running plus standing wave components. So we go to the blue tube regime, atoms are repelled from intensity maxima, and apply more light from the left than from the right. And this is then giving rise to an electric field which the atom sees um, where well the counter propagating beam is diminished by epsilon. Good. So Going back to this famous Hamiltonian, which I've shown to you previously, 
Um, well, this is the blue between case, so these are just the terms which I've shown to you before, which give rise to this lambda periodic double bond structure. And now a bit modified because of that. But then there's also this running rate component. The running rate component couples to a sign. So you see this cosine turns into a sign here. And uh, most importantly is that this couples now to the imaginary quadrature of okay? If this flips sign, then we come back to this lambda periodic structure. So you see that also this blue two case can support for this running rate cell organization such as structure. Okay, we take the base diagram, same procedure as before. We ramp up our pump power at a certain detuning, and you see that it looks like we had overlaid those two flipper phases. Then I'll plot also, I show you here the, the time of light images. So this is one structure, one crystal structure, the stripes, and these are the checkerboards, both at the same length. I show you here what we can measure with our vertical light detector. So we see actually that this phase of the light field jumps by pi over two if you go from one phase into the other. So we are cutting either for the real or the imaginary quadrature, depending on this stripe model. Um, good, so we can look at this in real time. And um, this is shown here. So we ramp up our pump power. And I'm showing you this on this polar plot. This is phase space for the light field. That's the real part, the real quadrature of the cavity field. That's the imaginary quadrature of the cavity field. And the radius here um, gives you the amplitude. Below, I'm showing you the face, only the face angle here of the slide grid, and you see we start, uh, well, we start here, and then we start ramping up the pump power over time, as shown here. And at a certain point, when the system jumps from one crystal structure to the other, we see that indeed this face makes a jump by pi over two, which is signaled here by going to the imaginary quadrature and the amplitude reduced by space time. You also see that this um, system starts oscillating, and this is because it's the first order phase condition. So you have some latent heat which is released if the system goes from one local minimum into a global minimum. And that's the picture which we have in mind here. We go from here to this configuration. When the system jumps into this new local minimum, then we have uh, dissipation which, which uh, gives rise to this static oscillation. But importantly, is what you see here. <coughs> This is the stripe structure, this is the checkerboard structure, and I showed for you here the, the center of mass of the wave function within the unit cell of this crystal. And you see that the center of mass is shifted between the two structures. This will be important for, for what I'm showing you next. Okay, that's, that's the wrap up. I've shown you phase transitions, these are second order phase transitions, these are first order structural phase transitions. But all of this is mostly for closed systems. Uh, just to check in the, in the dynamical um, on the previous page, we ramping from which one to which one? Um, we are ramping, I think, from here to here. That's the way to this one. Okay, so I guess which phase scatters more light, I guess? So the, the amplitude is reduced from one to one. This, this one here, the slight phase scatters more light. Mm -hmm. And then um, this other phase, which is dominated by one wave, uh, scatters less light. Okay. Yes, you can. I guess you can understand it because you need still to erase these light fields, uh, which is just harder if you make this check mm -hmm. Can I ask again, um, what is actually oscillating after the phase transition on the bottom right? It's the phase of the light field. And if you think of the atoms um, <coughs> scattering the light into the cavity, then you can think of them forming a bright mirror. And this red mirror, as I told you, changes its center of mass or the atomic wave function. So it's really the atoms which shape in space. And uh, this makes also that this mirror shape and makes the case. Make sense? Thank you. OK, what I've shown you until now was all true for a closed system. So dissipation was not important, but I promised you that I wanted to show you what dissipation is doing here. And this is now why we come back to this initial question and, and look back to why this was not important. Well, because the energy scale, which we have to compare um, 
or the energy scales which we have to compare are given by well the photon energy, which is the tuning between pump and cavity, and the, the cavity dissipation rate, kappa, so line of cavity. And the line of this cavity is on the order of 100 kilohertz. But the tunings which we have studied here were usually uh, much larger on the order of megahertz. So now we can repeat this experiment, but go to a regime where um, this transition takes place, between the two phases takes place, um, where the, the tuning is on the order of the dissipation rate. And now this dials in dissipation and makes it important for the physics. You see, it still has the same characteristics. So this is the space transition between the two. We have two different um, uh, light levels, and you see that we jump from red to, to green here, but it all looks much more noisy. So a bit disappointing. And if you take now many averages of this data, then we can smooth it out, but you see that this region here remains noisy. So this is a not so well defined phase, which is in there because it's tracking the whole time. And um, well, we can take a single cut. So if I follow this over time, so it's actually a time choice when we ramp up the pump power, I can now plot for you what the phase is doing. And the phase is doing this. And you can also guess the nationality of our postdoc, other than we decided to change the colors of the publication. <laughs> yeah, but this was the first excitement. And, and so you see that, that the space uh, starts uh, in sync with uh, what we know as the slide phase and ends up with, in sync with what we know as the second word phase, but in between it rolls in a step like fashion. And this is uh, one of those slides here. So uh, this is, of course, something which we try to understand. And first, we plot it uh, now again in phase space that goes on. And we see that the phase of the slide feed is really running in a circle uh, around the origin. And always, we have a finite light feed inside the cavity. We ne never touch the zero point here. So this is chiral uh, dynamics, that's what we call it. But still, we need to understand why this dynamics is setting it. And uh, this can be understood if you look at the equations of motion. So you know that the light field is providing the potential for the atoms, and the atoms are telling how much light is being scattered into the cavity. So we have a couple of equations of motion for the atomic wave function and for the cavity. And uh, here enters actually now our dissipation with I cover term. And if you just use now a Gross-Pietrowski equation and solve it, then uh, we actually find that the phase on our simulation does the same. So this matches, but still not giving you the full understanding why this sets it. I'll come to this a bit later. Using this GPE simulation allows us to look at properties of the system which we usually don't see in the experiment. For example, the overlap between the wave function and either the cosine pattern or the sine pattern. So this is theta q and theta p, and let's plot it here, and you see that we started in well this uh, stripe phase and end up in the checkerboard phase, but in between the two are, are swapping um, between each other. Now, knowing about the light fields allows us also to understand what the potential is doing. And we can rewrite these potentials as one short letters um, inside the cavity, which is lambda over two periodic, and the long letters, which is lambda periodic. And now the fun fact is that this phase, which runs, which I've shown to you, um, is making this long period lattice sliding in time over the short period lattice. And now I can show you a movie um, if you just plug in this, um, this uh, equations, and then you see that indeed uh, you have something which is moving in space. So it's potential which moves in space, but it's periodic, it always comes back to this mission. And this actually gives rise to pumping. So I show you here again the center of mass of the atomic wave function, which I've shown to you for the two extreme cases of the stripes and the checkerboard. It's shown now here by this yellow uh, cross. And if you go along a circle in our phase space, then this um, uh, potential landscape is deformed and pushes the atoms around. And at the end, you will have transported the atoms from the bottom of the stone here to the top. It looks like that. Now, this is something which we know um, since many years actually. It's this rice medium. So it's a 1D insulator, which can be described 
um, by two different extreme situations. One is that you have uh, equal lattice sites or equal energies on each lattice site, but you alternate the tunneling between the different lattice sites. And the other extreme case is that you have equal tunnelings, but then you have a side position. Okay, now you can evolve the system, and then uh, in your rounder space, you have this, this tunneling uh, difference and the side offset. And if you go around the circle here, then it was shown about this, uh, that you can actually produce now a pump in this system. So it's a uh, pump in an insulator. Well, we can uh, engineer this with cold atoms by having a short period lens and a long period lens and sliding the long period lens across the short period lens. That's exactly what should give rise to pumping. And this was shown in 2016 by the groups of Takahashi and I didn't look at Emmanuel Jones. And if you compare now their potentials, which they produced by having actually either two different colors of light and then having a function generated to slide their lattice across the other lattice and stabilize everything in space, which is quite challenging, then you see that these potentials are exactly what I've drawn to you before. So it's this lambda priori single bar or lambda priori double bar structure. They wanted to prove that they have transport, so they used um, their imaging system to look in real space where the center of mass of the atoms are. And you see here as a function of time or as a function of those phases which they made wrapped with their function generator, they could see that this uh, atomic wave uh, packet was transported in space. They could also do this. So that's something which we are very curious about if our system is doing the same. And uh, that's shown here. Um, concentrate on the, on the blue triangles, which is our transportation direction. So it's actually uh, perpendicular to the top. And you see that when our face wraps, we indeed see that this uh, wave packet is moved or transported along this wider region. <coughs> Since we have two cavities, we made the same experiment with the, the opposite uh, angles, so it's mirror symmetric cavity, and then we find that these atoms are now shown transported in the other direction. Good. So, still the question is who turns the handle? So, in the experiments of Takahashi and Block, you, you saw that they, they had to well, engineer those fields and then use a function generator to slide those fields across each other. And in the very classical example of Archimedes screw, you have something, which is the screw which you turn and you have to turn the handle and then you can transport. So a AC um, function gives you a DC transport. So you need something which uh, makes the Hamiltonian totally look the same after one period. But in our system, we are not changing the Hamiltonian. So what happens here is that dissipation is too low. So because we have this minus i h one kappa over a system uh, in the system, um, we actually see a so-called dissipation induced instability. You can imagine that we have um, the two crystalline structures which each have their soft load. So soft load is what you have um, for softness if you go close to a critical point to a base position. And if you have two of them, um, they can actually interact with each other. And we can make them interact or couple by a dissipation. So if you think of this as our control parameter, so the strength of this pump lattice, and this is the dissipated coupling, so how strong the dissipation kicks in. But for zero dissipation, you see that we have a direct transition between one and the other base. So this was the original experiment I've shown to you. And if you now go to this dissipated regime, then there is this non stationary steady state where these two soft modes are starting to interfere with each other. Now, I've shown you this picture before, and now you understand why we have this white region or why I wanted to have white because that is actually corresponding to this non stationary state. Um, we can look at the frequency spectrum. Getting out of the line of the KDT. So it's likely getting out of the KDT, and uh, we, we have our head line detector such that we can measure the frequency, and zero frequency means it has the same frequency as the light wave which we sent into the KDT or onto the atoms. So initially, the system is self organized, and it sketches just at the same frequency. Then, this is our um, dissipation induced instability where this stuff, so this phase evolves, and then we are back into the second phase. Now, this is what we can show if um, we um, solve the system, so it meets the equations. 
And you see these are the two soft modes, and that they look so funny is because you do the dissipation. And what happens here is that you have two modes which, which coalesce at one point, and this is a so-called critical uh, so-called uh, exceptional point. So this is always if you have systems, uh, optical systems where you have two modes uh, which are close to each other, and then you add dissipation in a non-emission way, then you see that um, you can have phase or synchronization of those modes, and then you have one mode which is damped and one mode which is amplified, and this amplified mode is actually what gives rise to this um, dissipation induced instability. We don't need to go through the full phase transition, we can also stop in between. So you see the protocol looks now a bit different. We end up and the system starts wrapping. And indeed, then we stay at a certain fixed frequency offset. And this is when this happens for how much more time and until the system actually decays. This is something which I would like to call a limit cycle. You could also now, um, I guess, semantics, you could say this is a continuous time crystal. And uh, at least if you, if you follow um, these references, then that would be a definition of a continuous dissipated time crystal. And then you could go even more fancy and say, well, what we see is a continuous topological time crystal because uh, there's topology in the system. So you see that we have this different lattices and the system is evolving between those two different types of lattices. And there's always a certain gap, a certain topological gap, which protects the system from going uh, from jumping or blocks. And uh, so then if there's an adiabatic evolution, we have a superfluid and we could expect actually that there's minimum energy exchange with the gas, which is wrong. Okay, so this was the main part. And I've shown you these emergent dynamics. I still have time. Good. Then what I would like to show you um, as the last thing is um, how we observe a dissipation stabilized phase. Okay, for this, let's again take a step back and think of light matter interaction on a very general level. And I'm sure here and in many other faculties, there will be uh, well, a plethora of these devices where you always couple matter to light. And if you try to describe it, at the end, you end up with this paradigmatic model where you have a single two level atom or two level emitter couples to a single electromagnetic field. The coupling sense is G naught, and uh, you have those two different frequencies. If you try to describe this, then you end up at the Marley model. So sigma plus and sigma minus are the atomic raising and lowering operators, A and A dagger are creating any rate. Usually, we are not in this ultra strong coupling regime, which means we can neglect energy non conserved terms and we will go to the wave approximation. And then we end up at the famous James Cummings model, where you see that you can swap your excitation from one um, system to the other system. This is true for a single emitter. Now, let's go to many emitters, it's n atoms. And then we can describe the same system by the Dickey model. So, this corresponds now to the Rani model. Where we still have co and counter rotating terms, no rotating rate approximation, we have this collective spin raising and lowering of waves. If we are then applying the rotating rate approximation, then we have a model which is called the Tennis Cummings model, which corresponds to the many body version of the James Cummings model. So you see the neglected of the energy non conserving curves. Now, you can combine those two models here. And that's something which we dubbed then the interpolating Dickey Tennis Cummings model. Because what was interesting for us is to understand how dissipation is acting on such a system. And um, if you think of these co encounter rotating curves, and if you have a way to balance them or to dial in more co and counter rotating um, um, terms, then you can first get some more understanding of what dissipation is doing. So you see that now we have not only one coupling parameter, but we have two lambda x and lambda y. And you see that jx and jy can be rewritten with the help of these lowering and raising operators. So at the end, you can show that um, we can dial in code and counter rotating curves. 
that's the model we want to study. Let's first look at the closest. So no dissipation. And then we found uh, that there's this phase there now, which emerges, lambda x and lambda y. And uh, the colored phases are corresponding to phases that the system actually would self organize, or if you think of a spin system, you would um, excite your spin. And Y means the R and the absolute non state of the system. And we see that there's a symmetry breaking taking place in either of those two cases. So going along with the extreme cases of either lambda x equals zero or lambda y equals zero tells you that you can neglect one or the other of those two terms and you come back to the Dicke model. And with the Dicke model, you know that you should have either a real part and a real quadrature of the KDT being occupied or the natural quadrature. Now, the special situation here is if you go along the diagonal, because in the diagonal, um, you see that this symmetry is changing from just a Z2 symmetry to a U1 symmetry. Something like a symmetry enhancement, which you can tune in by fine tuning the, your parameters. So, if lambda x equals to lambda y, you are actually able to erase these co rotating terms and you end up with the tennis tennis tennis. Now, let's look for the open system. So, that's described by this equation here, and that's the Lindelian. And you see that this uh, phase diagram looks qualitatively very different. So what used to be this white phase now extends even for infinite couplings. Uh, um, it goes up here on this side of the line. And the stronger the dissipation is, the wider this, this, this angle here will be. We see that the properties of this critical point have changed. So instead of having uh, now all those uh, phases, um, all those E phases actually merging at this point, uh, you see that only two phases are um, Merging at one particular point here. And you see that we have this light blue and light red phases, which are actually um, hysteretic systems or um, uh, cold systems, which infer that there's hysteresis if you go on this part of the map. So it looks very different. Also, the light field is expected to be different. You are either coupling to, or we are in both cases, coupling to both the real and imaginary part. You can imagine that if you have dissipation, then this mixes the qualities of of this field, and so you will populate both. Okay, then um, that was our theoretical result, and we wanted to show it also experimentally. And for this, it was not enough to only move with those external degrees of freedom of all those answers, for the sake, but we needed a way to distinguish co and counter rotating curves. And for this, we applied now a magnetic field and have are now able to address two different Zeeman subsets, the sub levels of um, mobility data. So we prepare the atoms in the state n of equals minus one, which we call here zero. So you see this is our Bose Einstein condensate, a symbol for it. And then uh, we have the other state of interest, which is this n of equals zero state, which is then a density modulated state. So now by applying a pump field, which we then send onto the atoms. Um, in a way that the frequency matches exactly this transition, this random transition, such that the total emission to the cavity will end up, uh, the atmosphere will end up in this other Zeeman substrate. So if you look here, that's our red tuned pump field, and the emitted field ends up close to the cavity. So if you do so, well, all the atoms will be scattered into that state, and uh, then we have a density modulated state and the dynamic state. Now we can apply a second pump field, which we call a blue tuned field. And you see that it has a different frequency, but we arrange it such that, again, we can emit it to the cavity, so it emits at the same frequency as our initial red pump field. And this is the way where we can go back to the blue lines of condensation. And funnily enough, you see that, um, well, we start from this density modulated state and go back to the unmodulated blue lines Okay, so but if those photons are emitted, they can also be reabsorbed by the system. So that's then this kind of a virtual process where uh, we actually can close this loop here, and this looks very much like a beacon model. But now it depends on the relative power of those two beams, um, which of those paths is more strong. So you, you, know, you can see that you can balance uh, going backwards or going forwards. 
because at the same time you have the competition with this dissipative processes. And if you pump more atoms uh, on the this blue line, then we will have more dissipation. Which goes on there. Okay, so you see that we have this Rabi weights theta r and theta b, which is just the strength of those two light fields. And by taking the sum of the two or the difference of the two, we can now actually model our um, two coupling problems. So this was this lambda x and lambda y, which is given by the sum or the difference of those two rather ways. And this is the way how we independently tune those co and counter Let's start uh, with the situation which we call the Dicke limit. So it's the balance situation. So eta r equals to eta b, which means delta eta equals zero. Then if I plot for you the energy diagram, then this is the typical mode softening, which I've talked to you before. This is the string, that's the sum of the two pump fields. And you see that there's a critical point where an excited stage softens, and then you have phase decision for this uh, superradiant state. Now, taking into account also this dissipative processes, you see that one of those two branches, so the blue one here, is getting the system being de excited from that state, and the other one pushes the extra upwards. So, this is the way how we imagine how those um, dissipation rates are, are affecting the system. But since the two are balanced, so delta is equal to zero, uh, we don't care, and we see that the gamma up and gamma down rate actually uh, are the same. Now, if you change the ratio between the two, then delta eta becomes non zero. And you see the, the length of this arrow here indicates that we have more blue dissipation than red dissipation. And what happens then is that the super radiant phase actually starts to cease. And at a certain point, point here, you see that there is no um, super radiance anymore possible because there's too much dissipation in one of the channels. Good, so that's something which we wanted to check experimentally. You see here, um, as a bunch of time, we are ramping up our pump fields, and I've got for you eta bar and delta eta. And you see you can dial it in a certain ratio between the two, and then in green you see how we find photons inside the phase. And uh, that's now a phase diagram where we have this difference between the two fields and some of the two fields, and you see that going along this horizontal line at the bottom means that we are doing this phase transition between the normal and the superradiant phase that's what we know as the big phase transition. But you see that actually we observe that this normal phase extends even for large couplings. And this is what I've told you to you before about this dissipation and um, stabilized normal phase. And that's the theory which we have plot on top of it and you see that there's at least a qualitative match. I've told you that there should be hysteresis also that's shown here. Um, we prepare the system either there or there, and then go up and down again, or down and up again. And you see that we need to observe this distributed certain cycle here, and uh, this tells us that we have this coexistence of phases. Now, last feature I can tell you here about is the excitation spectrum. So we can excite the system. And I've shown you this mode softening, which we should be able to observe. And we can actually probe it by sending a short pulse on the cavity axis. That's this orange pulse here. Um, I think it's a millisecond pulse, which we put into the cavity and then switch off this probing beam again and just study how light is scattered out of the cavity from um, the transverse pump fields. And while this happens, we are ramping up, as you should see here, as this. Dash and, and solid line, we are ramping up our control fields, which pushes the system across the phase transition. So you see that uh, here is the frequency of the light field coming out of the cavity, and uh, this is where we apply our pulse. And then uh, we ramp up those fields, go across the phase transition, and you see how the excitation energy is softening towards the critical point, which is here, and then the system becomes super radiant and scatters light into the cavity. So we can see in real time the excitation of the system, which goes down in frequency. This is for the case where we go along the Dicke limit. Now we can dial in a different ratio of delta meter of meter bar. 
and uh, go at, at different angles here. And you see that this excitation is decaying much faster than in the big units, but still at some point we find this uh, radiant phase. But if you go along this, traje this trajectory here, you see that the system is excited, but then it stops this excitation, it's decaying, and we don't find the cell phone position. You understand this? If we solve uh, again the Gallish formulas, in this case, the equations, and see um, indeed that the lifetime um, which we measure, so this is the lifetime of this side pulse here, as this dots, is um, matching to the theory which we developed for this. Okay, so this is summary of the second part. And you saw that we have these qualitatively different looking phase diagrams, and that we can actually um, explore this experiment. With this, uh, I'd like to approach my co-workers. So this is all done by two teams, and you see uh, these are the two teams which are currently working it. These are the former group members which contributed, our theory collaborators, and we run this experiment together with them. With this, I thank you for your attention. Yeah, thanks. So it was really wonderful. So I'm trying to understand why there's this dissipation induced uh, stabilized normal phase. Um, so right on the diagonal, that's where you don't have any counter rotating terms, right? Yes. In that case, your Hamiltonian conserves total particle excitation, I think. It should, yes. It should. Yeah. So is it that you need the counter rotating terms to go into the super radiant phase? To start, you know, populating your cavity, and when you write at this limit, your Hamiltonian just doesn't have any ability to populate the cavity. I think it's correct what you're saying. Okay. But you see, it's not only just on the line, but with the steps, huh? So yeah. it, it's really a question of weights that you have to compare. Right. So like a question of counter-rotating strengths, kappa or something. Yes. Like that. yeah. Okay, that's really cool. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, in your first part you made the argument that this is kind of a topological state. The topological gap. Uh, I was wondering if you're able to measure like either the decay time or like really quantify this gap and um, observe any other kinds of like topological phase transition or other dynamics. Yeah, so I need to be careful here because it's a, it's a hot topic. Um, so what 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 is topological in our system? And we had so initially we tried to avoid this more or less completely, but then the referee asked us to put it in, and uh, now we put it in. And what is topological is the nature of lattices because they correspond exactly to their rise scalar model, so these two different types. Um, if you think usually of topological transport as uh, the other two experiments which I mentioned, uh, then what you would like to use is either fermions with total band or you use a, an insulating bosonic system because then you can claim that, and that's another interpretation of what topological transport means. That you have a, a quantized transport, one particle per phase inclusion, which is not the case in our, in our system because um, we are not insulating, we are not doing the band. Um, well, we just finished those experiments. Um, I'm sure we will go on, but we didn't we didn't look into more topological features. But there should be because we have this topological lattice. At the same time, um, well, it's it's not the quantized version. Um, I, I was wondering whether that in the hydrodynamic measurement of your, if you have the reactive activity and activity at time. So what does this frequency uh, um, in your uh, in your phase diagram mean? Like, in which experiments? The hydrodynamic. The hydrodynamic. Oh, okay. Yeah. So have crystal. Yeah. And that frequency, how to is that is it that the aggregate band that frequency? So I would say that uh, um what we see is that the atoms are really moving in space. Yeah. And um then you can think of it a bit like a Doppler shift, yeah, which the atoms are, are transferred away and this gives you a, a shift frequency. Yeah, so so that uh, that uh, the, the z value of that 
Uh, you are referring to this spot? Yes, yeah, the magnitude. Ah, the magnitude. I would say the magnitude tells you uh, something about the strength of the density correlation. So, how many of the atoms are actually participating in this process? I see. Because this tells you how many photons are scattered into the resonation. I see. And then we can And then you have three chains, but as the other three parameters. Okay, thank you. Um, since you anyway have these two cavities or these cross cavities, is that something when you switch them both somehow into resonance that you get different topology? Or, like, I mean, so you thought when you have these single ones or each mm -hmm. of these and it shifted into a different one, they somehow, I don't know, tune these both into an interesting machine where they then. That would be one of the next projects. Yes. Okay, so the second thing. Uh, we, we don't know yet, and it's well, it's lots about tuning and fine tuning and getting the right parameter readings um, to have it really act in a robust way. And the two cavities have two different dissipation rates, which doesn't make it easier. Okay, so for anything interesting, the two dissipation rates need to be this on the same. No, I don't claim this, but uh, to find good parameter readings is probably harder if you have two different rates. Mm -hmm. Just then you need to play with the different tunings to do the two of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good question. How much of this physics depends on having a BEC in your cavities and the like the gas? Do you just get like colder temperatures, or are there other effects that the entry BEC helps you with? Well, so at least for for at least for this claim, let's say um, that we have a superfluid. It's important, and I can imagine. So we didn't try this with, with thermal gases, but I can imagine that there is much more energy which you pick up because you don't have this phonolic regime at the beginning of your dispersion relation. So this might be some protection against this. Um, all the descriptions which we use are relying on being able to describe it by single modes or by few modes. This few modes fashion. Um, I'm, but that's more a formal thing, and perhaps does not really tell you that the physics which you observe will be different. One thing which I believe must be different, but I'm still looking for the, the feature to observe it, is that if you take thermal atoms, then you can distinguish all of them, which means each of those atoms has a different coupling rate of activity. And then you have your bunch of atoms and you have average rates. And conceptually, if you have a Poulenza condensate, you cannot distinguish the atoms. So all of them are coupled in the exact same way. And so if you think of the original Davis Cummings model, then um, this assumes that you have identity coupling between all the atoms in the chemistry mode. And I don't know where the observation is different, but at least conceptually, it's a different thing. So, uh, I would be happy to learn where, where the difference is and what we have to look for. Is there a way to modify the, or I guess modulate the dissipation strength periodically to okay, just modify the trajectory that the system might take from one is almost? Um, so dissipation rate is hard coded by the by the chemistry mirrors. Uh, but at the same time, you, you saw that. Dialing dissipation means um, bringing the, the tuning with the pump and cavity uh, on the same order of this dissipation. So, in this way, one could think of changing the effect of dissipation. Any specific idea on that? or um, Nothing super concrete. I'm just curious whether yeah. like, you could, as, as you sort of see this step function moving from one small to the other, you could, I don't know, tune um, the way that. that yeah, it, it would require changing the frequency, and I hear this changes a lot of things at the same time. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, any last question? Otherwise, uh, I have some questions in the chat. So, and Good. the fact that many of you will get to show the videos relax later, so let's just.